This is week five, chapter 25. Once again, I've written on my whiteboard behind me the terms I want to run through for this week's lecture. The chapter 25 is on experimental design. It's on effective interventions, how to detect effective interventions about change in behavior, of course, since our text is lasting change, behavior analysis for lasting change. So to start with, does anybody have any questions they want to ask before I go into the lecture, the mini lecture? Not yet? Okay. Thank you, Teresa. None for now. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the uh, basically the first couple points in the front of the chapter, and particularly item one and then item two with A through M. Those are the main terms and concepts, and the rest of it as you read through, and, and these can hopefully make more sense as you read them, then you'll see the reasons how to compare them, advantages and disadvantages. So I'll be running over those. Now this is sort of part two of experimental design because in, in 601 you had experimental design for some basic simple designs and now we're going to more complex designs. But what I want to do is take a moment to share my screen and bring up a poster so I can quickly review with you the, uh, what happened in part one and what I'm talking about in part two is also going to be related. So let me try to I'm going to bring a graphic over to this monitor and then see if I can share my screen with this graphic. Let's try this, share. And let's see, there's the, uh, this is the one I want. Let's see if this works here. Now if I've done this right, you will be able to see a poster that I made, and I'll be walking through that poster. Yeah, we can see it. That's what I needed to know. All right, so the, uh, the bigger picture for experimental design is why do we use experimental designs? We're gonna go in and treat clients and try to make life better, so we try to get some measures of how they're doing to start with, what's happening in baseline. The baseline is their life up until we walk in the door. Once we walk in and start working with the child in the home, in the school, in the clinic, in the community, we're basically changing that child's life just by our presence. And we know from the research we need to be um, building some rapport and become a conditioned reinforcer so the child sees our presence as reinforcing and we can help the child move towards learning effective behaviors and replacing problem behaviors. So that's what we do, and we typically get a baseline. If we're lucky, we get some baseline, and then we try to jump into treatment as soon as the baseline is stable so we can see, can we change this and improve things? Experimentally, we need to be able to demonstrate convincingly that what we're doing really is responsible for the change, because behavior changes all the time. The one constant in the universe is change. That applies to behavior, too. Behavior is highly variable. So we're looking to try to find how much is the behavior happening, when, where, where it happens, where it doesn't happen, when it happens, when it doesn't happen, when it's happening, is it happening too long, not long enough, too many times, not enough times, is the responses too close together, do we need to spread out some IRT time between them, do we need to shorten the duration, so we're trying to look at it and figure out all of our measurement, all of our assessment, and we can get our baseline. So I'm gonna quickly run through this poster, and I'm going to blow up the sections to be a little bit easier to see on your screen. And just overall, the typically scientific method, since behavior analysis is the science of behavior, and science uses experimental methods, a science method to test a hypothesis, develop a theory, test a hypothesis, see if that hypothesis plays out, is what we think actually happening or not. So they've got it sort of going in a circle, and uh, I'm not even sure where we start. Let's see here. Develop theories, gather, okay, we've got to develop theories, develop a theory, we think the environment is responsible for behavior. So the main thing in behavior analysis is that behavior is a function of the environment. That's our major premise. Other fields use a premise that the mind tells the body what to do, and the environment is just somewhere in there. So we're not using a dualism model, but rather the monism model of there's the organism, genetically, per, genetically biological person, and their interactions with the environment of what turn those develop those genetic capabilities into behaviors. And we know if we can guide that sometimes, a lot of it happens naturally, and we're trying to use what we've learned from observing natural behavior changes and adaptability and the range treatments that will help mimic that and help improve behavior. 
So we've got this uh, hypothesis. We've observed to see what was going on. We think about how would I test this? We, we formulate that hypothesis, then we test with different treatments, and we gather the data, then we look at the data, we analyze and interpret the data to see, is it even changing? Can we even change behavior is one of the first questions. So that's just an overall model. There's a whole books on that one. So what I want to talk about is the experiment is about the significance, types of significance. Okay, I see. Monica's jumped in. Monica, let me quickly count you here. Yeah. So the idea of significance, you see my form at the top, behavior is a function of the environment. To me, that's the driving thing for all behavior analysis is all this behavior has got to be figured out how the antecedent variables are evoking behavior or eliciting and how the consequence for behaviors are affecting the function. So I can look at a unit of analysis, the ABCs, to see what's going on. We have significance as a very important concept. We have the statistical significance, which we use mathematical formulas to take out the variability. And we have clinical significance, did we actually improve and solve the problem? We have social significance, is was this important to the client, to the parents, to the school, to the community, did it have social validity? And we don't do statistical analysis so much with our field, because that's basically a, a mathematical model. And if there's variability in behavior, statistics is how you tease it out. What we do instead is we get the baseline, and if we've got variability in baseline, we keep adjusting the environment to try to minimize that so we get a fairly stable baseline. So we're trying to just take the variability of those environmental factors out to see what's actually the level of that behavior under normal natural conditions, which are often very complex. So that's it, kind of a touching on significance. The terms we're talking about is we're going to interpret the data based on the level and trend and variability of the data. So was the level high, medium, or low? Is it trending? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? Is the trend basically just a stable trend? So it's not really going up or down. It's stable. That's how we want a baseline. Once we do treatment, we want to trend it up for behaviors we want to improve and want them to stabilize level. Problem behaviors, we want them, of course, to trend down and then stabilize at a low level or not happening. We're going to use baseline logic, which is mean we're going to predict what we think would happen. We're going to verify that with our manipulation of independent variables and measure the dependent variable, how you behave depends on how you're treated. So the independent variable is the treatment. Dependent is how you behave under those treatments. So baseline logic is predict what's going to happen, verify if the changes indeed do happen because of your treatment, and replicate that change to demonstrate a functional relationship. We want to be able to describe the phenomena, predict what would happen, control. So we're going to use independent dependent variables to compare the presence of treatment to the absence of treatment, this level of treatment to the absence of that, and see, do we get a change when and only when we change the controlling variables? Are they really controlling variables? So we get a functional relationship by demonstrating experimental control. That's going to make us easier to convince people we actually know we have a good idea of why this is changing and how to make it get better. Yeah, so the terms we've got are experimental control, manipulate the treatment, the independent variable. What we do is independent of the typical environment. We do something different than a typical environment. We measure the change, depending, dependent variable depends on how you're treated. The functional relations show us how environmental conditions as consequences function to make more behavior or function to make less behavior. And we're going to interpret that data to see what we're getting, level trend variability. Uh, we're going to do what's called a visual analysis, some call it an eyeball analysis. Rather than statistics, we're going to look at the data and analyze it. Uh, we want it to be pragmatic. In other words, it's practical. We want to see, is this true? Did this really change when and only when I did the treatment? We're going to address internal, external validity. Does this work within this experiment? If, I, if you can see this one here on the ABABRTB, here's a child with a low baseline. Here's the treatment that increases. That now the behavior is happening at a higher level. Here we withdraw the treatment, and it goes back to baseline level. So we see there that uh, if it was low, we would have predicted nothing's going to change it. That's a null hypothesis. But our alternate hypothesis, which we're testing, our alternate hypothesis is we think we can change it by changing the environment. So when we see that it goes up under treatment, we see an AB design, thinking maybe it changed because of me. But if I go back, when I look at just an AB design and I see a change, I can't make a strong argument that it's that it could happen coincidentally. So I need something beyond an AB, a two-phase baseline and treatment. Now, in the second little graph here, we see a baseline with a lot of bouncing data points. So that's not a stable baseline. So whatever's affecting that particular behavior in that environment is not happening consistently. And if I jump in and try to change it, I can't be convinced that it was what I did. If I look at this variable line, and if I were to draw a line between the 
half of the point data points on top and half the data points below the line, I would look. I think I would see an increasing trend, even though it's dropping down. I see overall, I've got three data points below. I got three above, four, five, six above. If I draw that line, I think I'm going to see pretty much an increasing trend. And then in intervention, I see what looks like a continuing increasing trend. So with an unstable baseline, I can't make a strong argument that I'm the reason it changed. It might have been getting better on its own and then took over. So I can use this simple design of the, the two-phase AB, but I go beyond a comparison design where I just compare to this sometimes called return to baseline, because in baseline, there's no treatment for the target behavior. In treatment, there is treatment. If this is a child who is out of his seat all the time in the classroom, and I give him stickers for being in his seat, the treatment is whether or not he gets stickers. So he gets stickers when he's in his seat. That's a contingency. Now I go back to baseline conditions, return to baseline. I withdraw the treatment, so I can call it a withdrawal design. I withdraw the treatment, and the behavior reverses back down to a low level. So here I've, I've verified that it did change when and only when I changed treatment. It, didn't, it was coincidence, that's a pretty strong coincidence, which does happen. And then I go back to put my treatment back in, and now I am replicating. So I've got the, is the uh, prediction, verification, replication. That's part of my baseline logic to make my case that this is experimental control. It changes when and only when I put the treatment in. When I withdraw the treatment, it returns to baseline. So here's my argument there. I'm demonstrating a functional relationship by having demonstrated experimental control. So when I get experimental control and I can see a clear change, when only when I treat, I'm going to argue there's some functional relationship. Whatever I'm doing in treatment one, which is the same treatment in treatment two, I'm doing again, that those change of consequences in this simple example, stickers for being in your seat is correlated. It's not causing it. He could sit on the desk or sit on the floor, but at least it's correlated with the change. So I'm not showing a 100% cause effect, but I'm showing a strong correlation. And my goal is to be able to demonstrate experimentally that I have experimental control so I can identify a functional relation. Once I know that stickers work for this child for this behavior, I can find out if it might work for other behaviors. It may not work on another child. So this is single subject, and this is internal validity. Does it work in this experiment for this child? Now, if I took this and I did direct replication. If I replicated the same thing for another student in the classroom who's not in his seat very much, I do, assist, I do a direct replication, I copy the same thing directly and see, can I get external validity? Will this now work outside of this experimental treatment for child number one? And if I can show with another child, I'm chosen generalizability. I might get another case where I can't give the stickers it's not going to make sense the child is too old, stickers don't matter to a high school or what they might to a, to a elementary. So I could do a systematic replication and copy the, basically the same process. I may just use the different reinforcer instead of stickers. I may give a more free time or maybe less homework, some other condition. It's an independent variable, but I'm still going to systematically replicate a treatment and use this model to show a functional relationship by experimental control. So that's the good part about it. The disadvantage is I have to, to do this, I have to withdraw treatment. So ethically, I've got an issue that scientifically, I just want to show this is the controlling, these are the controlling variables. Ethically, I had a client getting better and then I stopped it. So I could show that it was my treatment, which is good experimental purposes. If you want to publish research, you've got to show you really are onto it. But ethically and in the classroom and in the home, parents and teachers don't want to go back to the problem behavior. So one way to solve that is to go to another design. Now, I'm going to quickly review the terms I mentioned above. I talked about level trend and variability. So here's three little graphs, and we're going to see that in one of them, there's a starting baseline, and we see it starting to climb. So I've got something that's responsible for increasing the rate of responding. And the other one, I've got a D ABAB design. To go back to the AB, AB design, there's my baseline that's low. Here in the box is my prediction. The null hypothesis predicts this isn't going to change. My alternative hypothesis, and that's what we do, we test the alternative hypothesis, is that I think I can make a change. So there was my prediction, there was the change. The prediction is no hypothesis said it was gonna change anyway, it wasn't you. So if that's the case, the prediction should stay up there. But when I pull my treatment out, I'm now verifying that it did not stay there. It appears to be my treatment. But if I replicate my treatment and get the same effect, I've got a strong case for baseline logic that predictably it wouldn't have changed. If it did change, it was coincidence. If it changed again, it was coincidence, that's the prediction, but I'm able to verify the change when and only when I do treatment, and I'm able to replicate the change. That makes a better argument case, a more convincing case that my treatment's making the difference. Okay, now I mentioned one of the disadvantage of the 
with withdrawal design, the reversal design, the return of baseline design, is, is that you have to pull up the treatment. So one thing I can do, and you, I'm only treating one behavior at a time. With multiple baseline, I could take the child that was out of his seat getting stickers, and I could collect a baseline and treat it, and I've got an A-B design, so I can't make a strong argument for functional relation because I'm not really reversing the behavior. I'm not reversing the contingency. I'm always giving the sticker for being in the seat. But I collect a second baseline, therefore a multiple baseline. It's still a two-phase design baseline and treatment. And I let the baseline run longer on a second behavior that's in a different response class. And when I see the behavior has stabilized in treatment, I introduce treatment, the delayed treatment for this behavior. And if that then changes, I've now verified that it changes when and only when I do my treatment. It didn't change until then. I kept collecting all this data to show that this did not spill over. If these were all the same response class, so if it was cleaning your room, he might all of a sudden then clean the dishes. He might clean the garage driveway. So I want the responses to be in different response categories. So the uh, so that's part of a, the, the second baseline lets me show that it kind of meets a prediction that it wasn't going to change on its own. And it didn't change until I did a treatment. So now I have verified a change. I can pick a third behavior and I can get a baseline on that and see that it's relatively stable and it's at a low rate. And the target is I wanted to improve it. I've delayed the amount of time and I don't have to delay the same exact number of days or sessions because a little variability helps show that it wasn't just a pattern. And then I see it stayed low and I did treatment. Now I have replicated my change. So I've got my prediction. This shows prediction. It didn't change. Alternative hypothesis that will change when I treat it. And there I verified the change. I replicated the change. So I can't make quite as strong of an argument as the AB because I'm not reversing the direction of the behavior, but I am showing it changes when and only when. And that's part of experimental control to I can claim a functional relationship. And this, so the advantage of this was I did not have to withdraw treatment. Now the disadvantage is that's a lot of data to collect that you don't really need all of it just to conclude it didn't change. So one solution to that problem, each design typically answers the question then raises the problem. So the advantage here is that I can take that same multiple baseline and I just probe, I test to see what's the behavior level here. I probe it for the three different behaviors. I want you to notice the multiple baseline, as you remember from 601, said we can do this for three different subjects, three different students in the classroom, or three different children in a home, or three different clients in a day program. We can do it for three different settings. We can do it for home, school, and community. If we can make behavior better in the home, we want to say, can I use this same design? Can I replicate or do a systematic replication? And can I get that improved behavior of some kind? Can I get improvement in the school? And I also want to know, can I get improvement in the community? So I can use the multiple baseline for, for two or more behaviors, because if it's two or more, it's a multiple baseline. This example just does three. A lot of times schools will do these. Schools use this. This is the most common used design in schools. And it often goes up to nine baselines, because I can have one child with a lot of behavior problems, and I just work on them one by one and demonstrate, let each one work. So multiple probe saved me a lot of time collecting data. I probed to show that it still had not changed until I did the treatment, and I saved a lot of time and data. Okay, now, the next idea here is I can take a multi-element design, and multi-element means more than one treatment. So this one's called alternating treatments. And I can try treatment B in the uh, math classroom to get improved behavior there, and I can try treatment, or treatment A, I'll say this is treatment A, I'm not doing a two-phase design. I don't really even need a baseline because this particular student, this subject, is his own baseline. So when I'm doing it here, this is this is this child's own baseline. It's his own level of responding under the conditions. And here, he is, he, if it's the same subject for three behaviors, he's his own control group. So with alternating treatments, I don't have to. You can get a baseline. I can get a short one. I don't need a baseline. And I'm going to put in one treatment, we'll say, on Monday. And that's going to be uh, at the... Uh, in the PE class, because that's a different environment. I've got a different stimulus control happening there. And then I'm going to try a different treatment in the classroom. On this, this will be Monday. I try it Tuesday and Wednesday in the classroom. I go back to Thursday and try it on the field and recess or in, a, in PE. Then I alternate rapidly and I go back for the following. For Friday, I put in treatment A. Then I go back to Monday and I do treatment B on Monday. So that way I'm alternating back and forth very quickly. 
and I'm going to look to see is there a difference between these treatments. Does treatment A make a higher rate of behavior? Say the loose, general, the loose term might be cooperation, but I'm looking for specific measurable responses. So if we want to define and measure behavior. The idea of the alternating treatment is I didn't have to use the baseline. I can pretty quickly find out if there's a difference. If these lines are crossing over each other, then I've got a lot of treatment interference. And treatments are interfering with each other. In this example, they're conveniently got a nice white space. So I can conclude that treatment A produces a higher rate of responding. And treatment B produces a lower rate of responding. So the someone asks the question, well, which one should we use? And I say, well, what problem are you solving? If you wanted more behavior, of course, treatment A gets more behavior. If you wanted less behavior, use treatment B. From an experimental point of view, I don't really care about the level of treatment. I just want to know, does it make a difference? And of course, then for social validity and clinical significance, which level of responding is going to serve the client in the, in the long term? Is it really going to be educationally significant? Is it going to be socially significant? Will it continue on in this child's life? If it only works once and never works again, I don't really help the problem. I haven't solved anything. But the point here is I've got a multi-element, which means two or more treatments, and I alternate them rapidly to find out very quickly. One issue about treatments is what if you did two treatments in a row and then you did a third treatment? Would the sequence of treatments make a difference? If I'm trying to teach a child to read, I've got to first, I know I've got to get certain skills in place like, like letter recognition, separate from number recognition, since those are simply symbols that represent letters or numbers have some other values. I've got to teach them to recognize the letter and then name the letter and then make the sound that that letter makes. So I've got that's letter A, it makes a A uh sound or a B makes a buzz sound. I've got to teach those first before I'm going to get the child to say those sounds together. Like if I'm teaching bed, it's ba, uh, duh. If I have him say it fast, ba, uh, bed, then he says bed. So I've got to get letter recognition, maybe the name of the letter, what the letter's called, and the sound that letter makes. So I've got to have them in a sequence. I'm not going to get him to say the word if he can't recognize the letters and know what sounds they make. So we know certain behaviors have to be shaped according to some hierarchy of, of skill development. But if I've got something, behavior that's, it's in the environment available, I can see which treatment's going to make more or less of that behavior. So I don't have to worry so much about treatment interference because I'm changing it so quickly unless the lines are crossing each other. I don't, I don't have to worry too much about sequence effects. What if you did treatment A first and then treatment B? What if you did treatment B first and then treatment A? Those are fair questions. And in other designs, I can do that. I can take a treatment, put it in, run another treatment, go back to the other treatment, and I compare the different treatments. But if you're doing more than one treatment, it's a multi-element. The other designs were a single element because this is the same intervention for all three behaviors or the same intervention for all three students or all three children. Same intervention for all three settings. It's a single intervention, the same independent variable. Here, and that takes a long time to get that data. Here I can find out much quicker if that independent variable makes a difference. So that's an advanced, that's a more alternative treatment, a more complex design. Another design I can use is Yes, go ahead. I can't see that screen anymore. Are you still trying to show that, the other one? You don't see the, ex the experimental design? Yeah. Thank you for telling me. Let me go yes. back over here and see. I noticed something jumped on the screen, and um, that must have bumped it out. There, now I can see. Thank you. Thank you for flagging me. Okay. Yeah. Let me real quickly catch up here. I see I have LD has joined in, and I have... Ronald has joined us quickly, and I have, all right, okay, catch up. And for those who, who jumped on, what I did is I'm recording this, and I will post it on the website. Now, do you remember what you saw last, which one of the designs you saw last? I think it was almost two designs ago. Uh, the probe? Yeah, I think that was the last one, the multiple, multiple probe. Okay, so for everybody who was watching and saying, well, well I want to see it, let me quickly sum it up again, just to, and I'll do it in a nutshell. Uh, one way to test two treatments was the multi-element is to alternate those treatments. And here treatment A is alternating every other day or every two days, and here's treatment B alternating, and they're under different stimulus control conditions. So the, the, the recess outside is a different environment or condition than inside doing math work. So I want to have, I need, otherwise, this, if the stimulus evokes all the same behaviors, if the same stimulus class, and the same SDs, it's going to evoke the same response classes. So I need to see if this treatment under these conditions will produce any difference in responding in this treatment under these conditions. 
And so the alternating treatment solves the time of solves the problem of collecting all that data. It answers pretty quickly whether or not there's a difference. And I can find out about two things at once. The next design then, where the subject again is their own control. And this basically has phase A, B, C, D, E, F. And this is actually a single element treatment, but it's going to be changing the criteria for the contingency for the reinforcer. My treatment's gonna to reinforce, you can see in this design, we're trying to get behavior to go up. I could have phase A, and this could be phase B1, because it's the same treatment. I could have phase B2, B3, B4, B5, because it is the same treatment, but I'm raising the criteria. And because that's different, some people will prefer to label each phase differently to talk about phase E has five data points and phase D has three. Is that fair to compare them? Because then the next phase has three. And this one over here has five. This one has four. And there's a reason for that I'm going to go into in a minute. So we'll take this. This is called a changing criteria. And over here is the number of responses I needed. In this case, the number of problems completed. We'll say it's math. And I click baseline and see the child did four. Next time he did two, the next two times I get baseline, he wasn't doing any math problems. And the teacher said, there's a problem with this, so I'm going to see, can I get him to do more math problems? Now, I need the behavior in the repertoire. I'm not teaching a brand new skill. He can do these problems. He just isn't doing them. So maybe it's a, if it's a can't do, I teach the skill. If it's a won't do, then it's a motivation issue. And if it's a won't do, that means the deprivation for the reinforcer is not high enough. It's not enough of a motivating operation. Or if it's well, won't do, it means the reinforcer is not strong enough. I'm not deprived of the reinforcer. And so this is a chance to set the criteria at a doable level and see if I can get the child to perform. So I set my first treatment, my B, at two. I know he can do two because he's done four and two before. So I have me to tell him to, to get these stickers. We'll say I've got some Spider-Man stickers and this kid loves Spider-Man. So I've luckily found his reinforcer. And I say, work two problems, get a sticker, and he does. Work two problems, get a sticker, and he does. Work two problems, get a sticker. So I now get this rate fairly stable, and we're three data points. Now I go to the next one and say, okay, guess what? Now I want you to work three problems, get a sticker. And he, he said, I'm not working any, any I'm not going to work three. But I offered again, and this time he does work three, and he gets a sticker. And he works three and gets a sticker, and three and gets a sticker. So I've changed the criteria. The contingency is do the work, get a sticker but I've changed the criteria. I'm getting more responses for the same reinforcer. And now that that's stable, and I had four session, four data points here, I raise it again. Now you need to do four problems to get the sticker. And since he figured out, I met what I said. Now I get three data points that meet my criteria. And now I'm going to raise it again. So now I want to get do five problems. And this time, I'm going to expand the length because I start to see an increasing trend here. Maybe he just decided to cooperate and do the work. Are the stickers really the reason he's doing this? He just decided maybe at home, uh, grandpa came to visit for a couple of weeks and said, I hear you're not doing your math. If you do your math and I hear that you're doing it, I'll give you a dollar every day. So maybe he's doing whatever the teacher says because the grandfather has a contingency. So that could be a confounding variable, an extraneous variable. So when I set the criteria here and I run it for a longer phase, it looks like performance is always meeting the criteria. That contingency, do five and get a sticker, looks to be controlling it. And I then raise it again, now do six. And I have some sessions of three data points apiece. We'd like to get at least three data points because with one data point, it happened. With two, we can draw a line, but, that, but we don't know if that's going to keep going down or go back up or go keep. So when I get three, I can look for a trend. Now, at least I've got three in a row, and it's trending right around my criteria, in this case, on the criteria. So I raise criteria again. I raise criteria again. I'm showing some experimental control and the contingency. But you could argue, well, he was just going to start cooperating more. So my way to reverse this is I lower the criteria. I'm not withdrawing the treatment, but I'm going to say, you just have to do, today you just need to do eight problems to get a sticker. And he meets criteria, which tells me that contingency, that criteria is what's controlling it. He wants those stickers, and he'll do less work for them, and he'll do more work for them. So this is my kind of experimental manipulation phase of my treatment to show it changes when and only when, and I can turn it up, I can turn it down. If we can turn behavior on, set it off, a tantrum, for example, then we've got to figure out how to turn it off. If we can turn it on and turn it off, then we can get a hold of experimental control, find out what's controlling that. So if you get a tantrum, we can turn it off. We want to turn it off right away so it doesn't get stronger, and then find other ways to ease into that and use stimulus conditions that don't evoke tantrums, try alternatives or redirections, whatever's in our antecedent package. But back to this point, it's a, it's a 
uh, changing criteria design and it's typically designed to bring a behavior up kind of gradually. Again, I've got the response in the repertoire. So in this case, I'm taking the frequency because I've got, I can measure the basic dimensions of the behavior. I've got occurrence, I can count, get a frequency count. I've got duration, temporal extent. I can see how long he does the behavior and get a measure. Of I can do the number of responses over time and get a rate measure. I can do the IRT, the time between responses, and get him to do something a little faster, a little slower by reinforcing the time between responses. So I can use my measurable dimensions. I can do latency, get him to start quicker once I say start, uh, duration. So this could be a number of problems. It's one of the measurable dimensions of behavior. Then, or this could be duration. This could be, if it wasn't math problems, it could be read for two minutes. And I do, then I say now read for three minutes. So I could be increasing the criteria, but the response I want, it's in the repertoire. If it's in the rep, I'm still shaping, but I've already got the topography. So within the topography, I'm sorry, across the topography, the behaviors are available. Now within the topography, I either want a higher rate or a lower rate of behavior. I either want to do it longer or do it shorter. I want him to eat faster, eat slower. I want him to start quicker. As soon as I say go, I want him to start. So I'm shaping in each of these one of my measurable dimensions. So it can be work more problems, uh, read longer. Maybe the, he's reading at the table and he's a quiet, quiet, shy child and the teacher can't hear him. So she sits next to him. He has to read loud enough to be heard from two feet away. And then she slides her chair back three feet, four feet away. So I'm shaping the volume, the magnitude of reading out loud. So once it's in the repertoire, I have the topography across the repertoire. I have the behaviors I need to do it. I can now shape some aspect of behavior, longer, more, louder, et cetera. That's changing criteria. Now we can also, so we're solving a problem here by strengthening whatever aspect of the behavior we need. Of course, we could flip this over if we were helping someone who wanted to stop smoking. If they were smoking 10 cigarettes a day in baseline, I could offer rewards for cutting back to nine and cutting back to eight. So it just would simply flip it over because whether we're increasing behavior or decreasing behavior, I can be reinforcing meeting the target where the target is less responses, like a differential lower rate of behavior or diminishing rate of smoking, diminish it down to a low rate. Um, this will, so the direction of change is based on what's going to solve the problem for the client, what's pragmatic, what's practical, what will make the life better when we stop. It's in the repertoire now. Will the natural environment maintain it? That's a big driving feature for us is if we teach behavior and skills, we need those to last. We need them being maintained by the natural world because we're not always going to be involved in the treatment. So that's a change in criteria design. It's back to a single element, but we're changing the criteria for it. Now let's go over here and we're going to come up with another design. And this is called a component analysis. And what we've got here is in a component analysis, I've got a behavioral package, which is a number of treatments. Here I've got baseline and then I've got the Y condition and I got baseline and I got a condition with Y and Z. I've got two variables going on here. So that's a behavioral package. And I got baseline and then I got uh, Y and Z again to test to see there's Y and Z, there's baseline, no Y and Z. And I'm looking to see does behavior change when and only when I do that. Now let me see something here. I'll check real quick. All right, sorry for the, all right. So with the component analysis, I'm gonna break those pieces of that package down. So in baseline, it's not happening. In the presence of Y, I'm getting a high rate of performance. In the presence of baseline, it's not happening. So I can compare, this would be like A, B, A. I can compare those three conditions because my treatment is bracketed by two similar conditions, the same condition. Now, I, I can go on to try the package Y and Z and see if that makes a difference. And if Y, Z, I also see gets 100% performance, but I can't legitimately compare Y baseline and Y, Z because it's not a balanced comparison. So I have to go over here and compare baseline, low rate, to YZ as a package back to baseline. Now I can compare those components, no treatment, two treatments, and no treatment. I already compared no treatment to one treatment to no treatment. Now I'm comparing no treatment to two treatments. And I can do the BZ again, the YZ again, and compare the two element treatment, the package, to baseline to two elements. Now I can test Z by itself. So I need to compare Z with matching conditions on each side. This is how I do my components. I had to have a balance. So if I compare YZ with a high performance and Z has a low performance and YZ has a high performance, I can look at this and conclude 
I don't need Z. I've got this beautiful package where I put together some components, but it turns out Y alone will produce it, and Z, I don't even need Z. That'll be more efficient. I don't have to have a complex package. So component analysis is take the package, compare it to, and this is the key, the balance is baseline, treatment, baseline, or treatment, baseline, treatment, or the component package to a single element. Here's another thing doing the same basic thing. Baseline is not happening. Under the Y condition, it happens half the time. Baseline, so I can compare these three elements, B, Y, baseline, and see that there is changing when and only when. And I can compare baseline to Z to baseline, and once again, I get about half of what I want. So I put those together, and when I put Y and Z together, I get 100%. The baseline, I don't. So now I conclude that Y contributes about half of the effect, and Z contributes half the effect. So this package, if I want more than 50% performance, I'm going to use the package, the full package. But this was analyzing the components of the package, and the key is recognizing that these letters, these, these are balanced. So if I was seeing this on a test question, it would say, which of the following represents the component analysis? And if option A had A, B, C, D, then I mean, I can't balance it. If option B had B, C, D, and then it had A, B, A, and then it had D, E, D, each of those three groupings, comma, that shows me a balance, D on one side, E in the middle, D on the other, A on one side, B in the middle, A on the other, B on one side, C in the middle, B on the other. I need those three bracketed to balance to say, look, I can compare each component in my package. That's a component analysis. That's how I test more than one dependent variable and how I tease out which variables are not contributing enough. If I'm happy with 50% for the conditions for that client, I don't need to do the whole package. Either one of these, maybe one of these is cheaper than the other and I don't need 100%. So those are going to be the practical, the pragmatic questions. Which level of performance and can I afford it? We've got this cost benefit analysis that says, why cost a fortune? Why Z doesn't cost that much? So the question is, could I use more of Z? If Z is pretty inexpensive, could I use more Z? and get more? Can I use Z and change the criteria and require more behavior to get the Z reinforcer? Or can I change the amount of Z? If you change the amount of treatment, that's gonna be called parametric, and we'll get there in just a moment or two. So that's a component analysis. Now here's an example where I've got a baseline, and this happens to be a, a eye poking, so it's a serious, it's self-injurious behavior, it's a problem, and we've got a pretty high baseline. So a hypothesis is, that maybe music will calm the child down. So we put in music, and we also think maybe if he's playing video games, it'll calm him down. If he's playing video games, maybe his hands will be so busy, he won't poke himself in the eye. So I can't compare baseline to music to video. I can see a decreasing trend. And if I did video games first, would I have gotten the lower and then the higher? That's where the sequence might make a difference. But to do a component analysis, I'm gonna have music, video, and music, and I'm gonna compare B condition to C condition to B condition, and I see that under the C condition, behavior is lower. Now I'm gonna to wanna to replicate that, so I'm gonna have to compare video back to music to video, and I see the same pattern. Music produces a higher rate of the behavior than video games. And I can see that I can balance the music video music or the video music video, and I'm kind of replicating my effect. I go to baseline, it goes back up. Without any treatment, it goes up near baseline. So it looks like these treatments are having an effect, but they're having differential effects. Music doesn't lower the behavior as much as video. I can go back and compare baseline, the video to baseline to video, and I can do it again to repeat my demonstration. There's video to baseline to video, and now I've verified, I've replicated that the behavior is changing. I'm saying there's a functional relationship between the presence of video games that produce a lower rate of this behavior than music, and music produces a lower rate than baseline. So whatever is feasible and is a cost effective and appropriate, in that setting, I then pick my treatment and I've done a component analysis. I've analyzed each piece of the components by a balance against another component. Now, I mentioned parametric measures, and this is a very complicated chart. So I'm gonna to touch on it briefly and then go to a simpler demonstration. This is gonna be, I don't remember the behavior for this example. Uh, in the baseline, we've got an FR1, a reinforcement for each single response that's continuous reinforcement. I see it's, it's going up. And so in this case, it turns out they don't want it to be up, so they try some treatments. So we're gonna take some reinforcers, and they'll say baseline is where he's not getting, he's getting reinforced on some schedule, it's continuous for something. 
but I'm trying to reduce it. So whatever's reinforcing the behavior is making the problem worse. So I'm gonna try giving him a small amount of reinforcer. And that's gonna be the empty circle and see if that reinforcer for this other behavior, I'm obviously reinforcing an incompatible or alternative behavior or something else. And I'm gonna try a small amount of reinforcement and test that three or four times to see, and it looks like that's dropping it. Now I can also change the amount of the treatment so before I change the criteria to get it, here I'm actually changing the, the parametric, the many measures of the actual level of treatment. If I were the doctor, I would get say 10 milligrams of antibiotics, take it for five days. I come back and say, doc, I'm still sick. You know, he'll give me 20 milligrams of treatment, antibiotics. So here I'm trying a small amount of treatment. Maybe that's an M&M, maybe a medium amount is five M&Ms, maybe a large amount is 10 M&Ms. And so here the difference is I am varying the amount of the reinforcer to get the behavior to see how much can I lower the behavior for that. And I'm seeing here in the end, all three of these finally seem to help lower the behavior. So I can, if I can't afford the reinforcer, I may just use a small amount. Sometimes a small amount will reduce a little bit. And of course, a bigger amount of the reinforcer might reduce it more or might, I'm reinforcing the opposite behavior, some incompatible, obviously. So the idea of a parametric, it means many measures many values of the independent variable. How much do I get for, how much be able to get for two stickers? How much be able to get for four stickers? So to demonstrate that, I'm gonna to go to the change of criteria design. Uh, I, meant to, I meant to show that. Here I showed it going up. Here I would show it going down. I forgot it was on this chart. I'm gonna use the change of criteria design to demonstrate parametric analysis. So here I've got the baseline, and now I'm gonna say, here's two stickers for doing problems and I get two problems. Now I say here's uh, three stickers. So rather than, so I'm measuring the, the uh, I'm measuring the amount of performance. I'm always measuring the response, the measurable behavior. But what's different up here, instead of changing the criteria, you must do two, you must do three, you must do four. What's changing is I'm going to give two stickers, two, two consequences, two stickers, two items. And then I'm going to give three stickers and now four stickers and five stickers. And I'm still going to and I'm gonna watch and see how much behavior can I get. So I'm, I'm measuring performance, but I'm seeing how much of the reinforcer do I need? And maybe I'm happy at this level. So I realize I'm gonna need about eight stickers to get this kid through an hour of cooperation in the classroom. So it would look a lot like a change of career design, but the difference is parametric is I'm increasing the amount of reinforcement uh, for the behavior. And with change of criteria, I'm raising the criteria for a behavior to get that reinforcer. This may be a single sticker. And I'm saying, now if you want that sticker, you gotta do more. You want that sticker, you gotta do more. I'm changing the criteria for the reinforcer with parametric, I'm trying, will more of the reinforcer make it go up more? So when I mentioned over here with the other design is if I'm getting a certain amount of behavior for, for a music, can I change the amount of, of treatment and can I lower it in some way, shape or form? So that's a quick review over the poster that I built. And this is in that, Professor Noah Tall video collection. This is the same place I post the lectures, and that's an overview of all of the designs. All right, I'm going to drop that out and come back to the. Gotta move, I've got to move the window here. All right. So now I'm going to go back to my whiteboard behind me. And what I mentioned here, well, these are the terms I want to walk through. So rather than draw the designs out and try to make them all fit on the board, I showed you those designs. So now I'm going to talk through the things that I mentioned in that, just to familiarize you with the terms you're going to read in the first part of the chapter. And then as you read the next things, you'll see how to compare and contrast the advantages and disadvantages. They'll give you more details. So point number one was how valid is what I'm doing? And I need to talk about internal validity and external validity. And I wanna talk about are the changes I'm making beneficial for the lifetime of the client? Am I really doing something socially significant, which relates to significance, which I'll touch on again. So if I've got internal validity, I'm saying this works in this experiment for this child. If I then try to use that same thing for another child, I'm getting external validity. So can I take this treatment and can I, do the thing for someone else and will it work for someone else? I know it worked for Bobby, will it work for Mike? So the internal validity is, was it valid? Could I get experimental control? Could I show that this treatment produces a functional relationship and I experimentally demonstrate 
and it works for this child. Now I got something to build on and see, can I get the natural environment to take over? How do I get the teacher to bring that behavior up to strength? How do I get the parent to bring that behavior up to strength? And how do we then transfer stimulus control of the conditions under which they did it and get that to move over to environmental stimuli that will evoke the behaviors that can be reinforced more naturally? That's the ultimate goal is we can't always be there to manipulate but first we get the behavior in the repertoire and get it under some strong reinforcement. Then we thin the schedule and we move to new environments and add new SDs that are natural triggers of the environment. And instead of the extra, if it works for this child, it might work for another one. Can I export it? Can I do it externally? And again, the third, how valid is it? Does that change really benefit the client long-term? A short-term thing is good. If I cook a meal, I can feed him and he's eating today. But if I can teach him to cook his own meals, he can eat every day. So that's the idea of how valid is this internal, external, and are the changes really focused on helping the client have a better life? Now with section B, I've got A through M. So A and B is basically trying to further explain internal, external validity, which I touched on just now. C was talking about changing criteria, and I went through changing criteria graph to show that I raised the criteria for the same amount of reinforcement. So it's the same amount of treatment, but I'm requiring more behavior. Once I get the behavior in the repertoire, I can gradually get either more responses or longer behavior or louder behavior to change the magnitude. If you're going to throw a ball, I need you to throw it further and stronger each time. So that's why I can take an existing repertoire. And then once the topography is in the movements and the ability to do it, I now want to change some aspect, do more of it, or I can do less of it. That's changing criteria. The multiple probe we talked about going back to is the single element, and we save time on all that data by getting some probes to show that it changed when and only when, because again, we're talking about experimental control to find a functional relationship so I can build a treatment that will match the function as close as possible, and then that will maintain behavior. Sequence effects I mentioned, if you teach things in a certain order, if you do your treatments in a certain order, it might have some effect. The question is, what if I did the other one first? So you can get to some very complicated designs of do A baseline, then B and C and D, or you could run it then and do B, D and C, or B, C, D, and you could do the different orders to see, does the sequence make a difference? Sometimes it does, and if we're doing skill building, obviously we need foundational skills, foundational recognition of letters, numbers, sites, of sounds. The multiple treatment I mentioned was the alternating treatment design. So we're multiple treatment, alternating multiple treatment, and multi-element, more than one element, and therefore I'm can use more than one. The designs that let me do that was the alternating treatment. I could have two treatments at once. I could have them in three. Or I could use the component analysis. Now, the component analysis is, I don't think it's in this chapter because it's not on this list, but I covered it just to show how it's a multi-element design. Then the parametric measures, remember, was how much of the reinforcer, which looks like, but is different from how much, different from the changing criteria. But then again, I wanted to have Experimental significance, does my experiment significantly show me a functional relation? Do I have experimental control? Have I shown it changes when and only when I do treatment? And then I want to have clinical significance, which is the pragmatic part. Is it practical? Did this work? Is this true? Does this really solve the problem? So our clinical significance goes up to the changes that are really supposed to last and be valid. Part of social validity is, is that change desirable? Is the method and treatment desirable? Is it acceptable to the client and to the parent, to the teacher? acceptable community. And so I want to have clinical significance as well as did I actually solve it? And I needed social validity. And educational significance is will this really advance the child's learning skills for his educational career to get him the basics to learn and keep learning? So when I'm talking about significance of treatment, it's so important that what we do be effective and, and it's got to be significant at many different levels. And this brings that part you're going to read about those in the chapter. The last thing then is going to be for L and M was the difference between direct replication and systematic replication, which I talked about briefly that the direct replication is going to be, can I use the same thing for this for another for another phase of the child? And systematic is can I use the same basic approach but move a few of the pieces around? I'm still going to systematically follow the essential procedure, but I might change the reinforcer and the location. Those are different variables. They may affect where behavior happens. So those are the basic terms from the chapter. Again, I didn't draw all the designs here because I couldn't make them all fit. So that's where I brought up the uh, experimental design. And I'm going to once again bring that up real quick. And I'm going to share that screen.
And the reason I'm doing that is if you didn't already take a picture, I'm going to make this as big as I can. This is a quick chance to take a picture of that. If you, if you know how to take a screenshot, uh, this is it in a nutshell. Okay. And if you don't take a picture, it's okay. I won't know. But if you go to that YouTube channel where I post this lecture, you will also see an entire 20, 30, 40 minute on, on design. You'll see a couple of them there. Every so often I redo them. So I'm going to stop sharing and come back to my screen and make sure I've got one.